generous people are thankful people. Generous people understand that at every time and every season, we should remember to give thanks to God. For where would we be were it not for the mercy and the love and the goodness of God? A wise woman was traveling in the mountains, and she found a precious stone in a stream. The next day, she met another traveler who was hungry, and the wise woman opened her bag to share her food, and guess what? The hungry traveler saw the precious stone and asked the woman to give it to him. She did so without hesitation. The traveler left rejoicing in his good fortune. He knew that the stone was worth enough to give him security for the rest of his life. But a few days later, he came back to the return the stone to the woman. I've been thinking, he said, I know how valuable the stone is, but I give it back in the hope that you would give me something more precious. Give me what you have within you that enabled you to give me the stone. Have you ever wished that you had a spirit of generosity and a heart of kindness that overflowed with goodness for everyone? Jesus understood the challenge for human beings, and so he tells us the story about the widow who went into the temple in Jerusalem. He observed her. He observed rich folks, and somehow Jesus, as he observed them at the temple, observes all of us here today. He knows what our motivation is. He knows what we have. He knows what we give. And Jesus knew a number of things about this woman. That as a widow, it was a difficult time in her life. That not only did she have less financially, but her well-being was not defined by her anymore, but her well-being would have been defined by her access to a relative of her husband. And if she did not have access to a relative of her husband, then it means that she, like the orphans, and she, like the sojourners, was going to be at risk of going hungry and becoming homeless. Jesus knew that this woman who lived at a time when it would have been easy to say, no, somebody should take care of me. This woman understood what giving and thanksgiving meant. You see, she was raised in the temple and in the Temple practice in, in Jerusalem as a Jewish person, there were 13 opportunities to give offering. Did you hear me? 13. If, if we took a second offering, some people would cry, and definitely if we took, took three, you would say it's too much. But in the temple, they had 13 shofars. They were made like trumpets, and each trumpet or shofar had a designation, had a title inscripted on it. You could give to the new shekel dues. You could give to the old shekel dues. You could give a bird offering. You could give young birds for the Holocaust. You could give a wood offering or an offering of frankincense. So you could give gold for the mercy seat. 
And then there were what was called six free will offerings. And in this culture of giving, this woman understood that when God invites any human being to give, it's a privilege. And that when we give, we find ourselves spiritually and we achieve personal and financial success just by learning to give to God. So here is this woman, and all that she has is what the King James Version calls two mites, but what the modern translations call two leptons, or she had two small copper coins, or literally the, the, le the lowest means of exchange in her world. Now, in Jewish culture at that time, it was not permissible for anyone to, give a, to, to make offering without giving two gifts. Not one, but two gifts. And so she was given the smallest legal gift possible. She came with what was the equivalent of one sixty-fourth of a day's wage? And I want to ask you, why would somebody who is personally challenged, why would somebody who is going through a hard time, why is someone who felt abandoned and left alone, why is someone who maybe was enduring the shame of the world at that time, why would she show up with all that she have and give to God? Maybe this woman had heard three rules of life. If you don't go after what you want, you will never have it. If you don't ask, the answer will always be what? If you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And if you don't step forward, you will always be in the same place. There is something about the nature of this woman which said to herself, I am not a victim. There are a lot of folks who walk around even though you are named as a child of God, but you're walking around as a victim. And if you are thinking, victim thinking, then usually it implodes upon you, it devours you, and it prevents you from experiencing all that God had for you. This woman knew that there was power to making an offering of thanksgiving to God because when you focus on God, you stop thinking solely about yourself and instead you realize that you're a beneficiary of something wonderful. But I think there are three things that are highlighted about this woman. She, in her mind, had a commitment to people. And when you have a commitment to people, you do a number of things in your encounters with them. You are, first of all, thankful for people. Can I ask you, who in your life and who on your journey are you thankful for? And when was the last time you told them you were thankful for, for them. Somebody has had an impact on you. Somebody is helping you, praying for you, inspiring you, lifting you, working with you, pulling with you, struggling with you. Oh, we ought to remember to say thank you to the people around us. 
When you're committed to people, you are not just thankful for them, but you are thoughtful of them. You are always thinking to yourself, can I help them? Can I pray for them? Can I seek good for them? Can I send some fertilizer at their root? Sometimes when a person is up at the higher levels and moving, you don't know the impact that fertilizer has in making sure that the person continues to grow. Being committed to people means that I am in it and you are in it. She understood that to be a part of the temple community, she had to make a commitment not just to God, but to the people around her. Because the temple in Jerusalem was a place of service. The temple helped people. The temple built people's lives. And I want to challenge anybody who has never given to God or who has never made a pledge to God to say to you that if you are seeking to honor God and live for God, it involves a commitment to real people. There is no heaven-bound journey that's just you and God. Salvation is found in the midst of something called community. And that community is what's called the church of Jesus Christ. So if you are loyal to Christ, you ought to commit yourself to a community of faith. When somebody tells me I'm a freelancer, I just go from church to church. I like this today, but I like another one. And I'm jumping all around. I'm saying to you, church is not just about hopping from place to place. It's about committing yourself to growing and building and working with others so that God's name is glorified. This woman, she had two simple, small copper coins. But she says, I am in it. Don't look down on me. I am going to give what I have. And I'm going to give my best. But the woman also had clarity. And sometimes life in the Western world and life in America turns up us upside down. She knew that money and possessions are gifts from God. Anything that I have, anything that you have, is a gift from God. And if foundationally you are aware that it's a gift from God, then you get up each and every day and you say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I love you. I praise you. I honor you. I glorify you because you have chosen to give it to me. And if God gives anything to you, here is the second piece. That it means that God trusts you. Have you ever thought about it? God trusts you that you'd handle what he's given you. And the challenge for most of us in our journey is that we have found ourselves not to be trustworthy. If you're paying all that you have in debt, then somewhere along the line, you have mistaken God's trust and you have chosen to walk away from God and God's providence and instead indebted yourself.
to Citibank and to Chase and to Bank of America and to the check cashing place and the payday lender and somebody else. A part of being trustworthy means that we get back to a point in our lives where we say to God, God, help me to handle what you have given me. This woman at the temple had clarity because she was the, 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 the gifts or the trumpets or the shofars were not in the part of the temple where the men went. They were out in the woman's section of the temple. And in those days, women and men could not freely worship like we are. She, she was restricted. And yet she understood that the money and possessions can bring about social justice and change. Because it's about helping your neighbor and lifting your neighbor. She had great clarity. And I'm asking you this morning, are you looking on what God has blessed you with from your perspective, or are you looking at it from the eyes of God? Help me, let me help you with a little story. There was a blind girl who hated herself because she was blind. She hated everyone except her loving boyfriend who was always there for her. She said to herself that if she could see the world, she would marry her boyfriend. Well, guess what? One day, someone donated a pair of eyes to her. She could see everything, including her boyfriend. Her boyfriend asked her, now that you can see the world, will you marry me? The girl was shocked when she saw that her boyfriend was blind and she refused to marry him. He walked away in tears. And later on, he wrote a letter to her saying, Just take care of my eyes, dear. The eyes she had were his eyes. Sometimes we miss seeing where our blessing comes from. Sometimes we miss seeing how good and kind and merciful God is. Last week I asked all of us, including myself, just to look at the moments in your life when you have had defining moments and changes and look at how God acted and how God helped you and how God led you and how God nurtured you and how God provided for you and how God made a way where there seemed to be no way. A lot of us are blind and we can't see where our blessing comes from. The woman had commitment. She had clarity. But she also had confidence. Confidence comes from knowing that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Confidence comes from knowing that God is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Confidence comes from knowing my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Confidence comes from, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Confidence comes from knowing that I am 
God's son. I am God's daughter. God loves me with an everlasting love and he has promised never to leave me or forsake me. Here is the challenge of today's Christian is that many of us have the scriptures. We have the word of God with us. We have the name Christian. But we have lost our confidence in God. You're worrying about your destiny. But who controls today and tomorrow and next week? Is it you or is it God? You're worried about some of the dark clouds hovering around America and around the world. You're wondering, is it ever going to work out? This woman shows up in a radical way and puts in her two mites because she knows that God will take care of her. There is a time in the life of every woman and every man who calls on the name of God for us to ask ourselves, where does my strength and where does my help and where does my confidence come from? Does it come from me or does it come from the living God? So I can imagine her waking up that morning and they had unlimited giving times in the temple. But I'm calling her a morning person. She could be a night person. But I can imagine her getting up, brushing her teeth, washing her face, and said, I'm going to have fun today. I'm going to enjoy the joy of giving to God. I'm going to pour out my best. I'm going to give my all. She knew that your cup is smaller when you hold on to everything, but when you start pouring out and giving and blessing, your cup overflows. She knew that being generous would change everything for her. Good old John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says, Do all the good that you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways that you can, in all the places you can, at all the times that you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. In this time in which we live, you either act with generosity or with despair. And I'm inviting you to take from the bulletins your pledge card and think about yourself as this woman did. Think about your commitment to the work and the worship and what God is seeking to do through this house of worship and this congregation. And ask yourself, how much do I believe in it that I will support it and give to it? Secondly, ask God to give clarity to you about where your blessings come from. And thirdly, ask God in confidence to help you to remember that as his child, he has all that he desired for Jesus Christ and has given it to you. We are joint heirs with Jesus. For the next year, take your pledge. Write on it. There's an envelope. Put the envelope. Put the card in the envelope. And as the choir sings, a really wonderful song. The message for all of us is, do you want drought? Or do you want it to rain? 
overflowing in your life. Let's offer our gifts. Let's offer our tithes. Let's offer our pledges. Let's offer our offering to God so that he is glorified. 